Hello everyone. In this video, we'll learn the major anatomic landmarks on panoramic radiographs. The landmarks shown in this video are required learning for first year dental students, dental hygiene students, and dental therapy students of the University of Minnesota School of Dentistry. Prior to learning this unit, we expect that students have already mastered the intraoral radiographic anatomy of the maxilla and mandible. In learning radiographic anatomy as seen on panoramic images, we should remember four major factors. First, we'll spend a few moments to understand how to view a panoramic radiograph. A panoramic radiograph is not a flat presentation of the maxillofacial region. We will consider a panoramic radiograph as three radiographs stitched together. More about this in a few moments. Second, we should know the major bony and soft tissue anatomic landmarks and their variations. As we have learned in the intraoral radiographic anatomy videos, the appearance of anatomic landmarks varies from one patient to the other. Therefore, it is important that you review as many panoramic radiographs as possible to learn the variations of the anatomy. In this video, we will be using only two radiographs. The second radiograph shows some landmarks that were not visible on the first radiograph. For your own learning experience, use any other panoramic radiographs to identify anatomic landmarks. There are hundreds of panoramic radiographs available on the web. Third, we expect that you are aware of the concept of ghost image formation. In this video, we'll learn only a few anatomic structures that can create ghost images. This video is not about the principle of ghost image formation. You may want to brush up your knowledge from previous lecture materials. Fourth, you will need to understand different errors on a panoramic image due to patient positioning errors as well as motion errors. Errors on a panoramic radiograph were covered in a previous lecture. Positioning or motion errors may create a significant discrepancy in the presentation of anatomic landmarks. As you have learned earlier, a panoramic or a pantomographic image is a single tomographic image of both the jaws and their surrounding structures. Because it is a tomographic image, it adequately records only the structures inside the focal trough. Structures outside the focal trough or focal plane are usually blurry or not even recorded. If your patient is not properly positioned, some of the structures may be out of the focal trough, making them blurry or distorted. An ideally recorded panoramic radiograph is also somewhat distorted. Therefore, measurements obtained from a panoramic radiograph are not reliable. Make sure that your radiograph is properly mounted on the view box or your computer screen. All the panoramic radiographs will have a marker indicating left side by a letter L. Some units may have both right and left indicated with letters R and L. You will review the image with the patient's left side on the right side of the computer screen or view box. This is similar to the way you are talking to a patient face to face. While talking to a patient, your right side is patient's left side. A rather simple way of reviewing a panoramic radiograph is to consider this one image is three images stitched together. Mentally, split the panoramic radiograph into three parts as we see here. Consider the right posterior area as a lateral radiographic view, as if you are standing on the right side of the patient. This is a simple explanation of a quite complex radiographic projection. You should also remember that the panoramic view of the condyle is not a true lateral presentation. But for now, we'll proceed considering the right side as a lateral view. The patient's cervical vertebra is on the left edge of the screen. Let us consider the central part of the image as an anterior view, as if we are standing in front of the patient. In this view, the patient's cervical vertebra is behind the computer screen. Finally, we'll again consider the left posterior part of the jaws 
as a lateral view, as if this time we are standing on the left side of the patient. Remember that this is a rather simple explanation of the position of the anatomic landmarks for a very complex imaging technique. On this section, the cervical vertebra is on the right edge of the screen. By now, you may have realized that the cervical vertebra is recorded three times, once on the left edge, once on the center, and once on the right edge of the image. Some other structures, such as hyoid, may be recorded twice. If we stitch the three images into one, we get a panoramic presentation as seen here. Let's use this image to learn several critical radiographic landmarks. Let's start from the left edge of the image, which is the right side of the patient. The radiopaque entities are the cervical vertebrae. If your patient is large, you may see only a part of the cervical vertebrae. On a child, it is possible to record a wider area of the cervical vertebrae. As you can see, the vertebra on the left side is only partially recorded. A little mesial from the cervical vertebrae is a curved line of contrast. This is the right ear lobe. Let's review the ear lobe on the left side. Superimposed over the ear lobe is a slanted radiopaque entity. This is the styloid process. There may be a significant anatomical variation of the styloid process. In the fall semester, we'll learn about the calcification of the stylohyoid ligament. This is the styloid process of the left side. On the superior part is the right condylar head. On many panoramic images, the superior border of the condyle may be obscured by other superimposing bony structures. After we identify the condylar head, you can see the posterior border of the right ramus. Superior to the condylar head, we can see the articular fossa. Let's look at the left side. The bony protrusion is the articular eminence. On the mesial part of the condyle, we have a bony depression called the sigmoid notch. The linear entity near the angle of the mandible is the hyoid bone. On the left side, you may also identify the hyoid bone. So the hyoid is recorded twice on the panoramic radiograph. There is a horizontal line of contrast extending past the right ramus. This is the ghost image of the inferior border of the left mandible. Now that we know the sigmoid notch, we can continue further mesially and identify the conical structure, the coronoid process. Inferior to the sigmoid notch, we can see the parallel lines of the inferior alveolar canal or the mandibular canal. In this image, the anterior part of the canal is challenging to identify. In many panoramic radiographs, the canal is quite easy to identify. In many images, the outline of the canal are quite faint. On the left side of the mandible, we can see the circular mantle foramen. On the right side, the foramen is not adequately visible. Superior to the coronoid process, we have a inverted teardrop-shaped radiolucency. This radiolucency is called the pterygomaxillary fissure. A number of neurovascular structures are present in this fissure. On the anterior aspect of the ramus, the radiopaque band is the external oblique ridge. Now that we know the sigmoid notch, the coronoid process, and condylar head, we can see a radiopaque band on the superior aspect of these structures. This radiopaque band is the zygomatic arch. On the mesial aspect of the zygomatic arch is a J or fish hook shaped radiopaque band, the zygomatic process of the maxilla. The zygomatic process of the maxilla is close to the maxillary first molar. Superior to the zygomatic process of maxilla is a curved radiopaque band. This band is the rim of the orbit. Superimposed over the coronoid process is the maxillary tuberosity. 
The tuberosity is the distal most area of the maxilla. We have identified the zygomatic arch and the zygomatic process of the maxilla. Adjacent to the zygomatic process of maxilla is the wall of the maxillary sinus. Superior to the roots of the maxillary teeth is a linear radiopaque band. This is the heart palate. Superior to this well-defined appearance of the heart palate, there is a parallel fuzzy radiopaque line of contrast. This line of contrast is the ghost image of the heart palate. On the distal aspect, there is a line of contrast with soft tissue density mass. This mass is continuous with the border of the heart palate. This finding is the soft palate and uvula. Once you have identified the soft palate, there is another line of contrast. This is the posterior surface of the tongue. Inferior to the border of the tongue, as seen on the right side of this radiograph, is a curved radiopaque band. This is the epiglottis. On this radiograph, the epiglottis is superimposed over the hyoid bone. Superimposed over the floor of the orbit are two radiopaque lines. These lines are almost parallel to each other. This is the infraorbital canal. On the posterior aspect of the border of the soft palate, there is a wide radiolucent band. This radiolucent band is the nasopharyngeal airway. Near the midline of the maxilla, there is a curved radiolucent band, the common nasal meatus. I am tracing the right meatus. Please try to identify the meatus on the left side. Now that we know the common nasal meatus, we can identify the medial border of the meatus. This is a thick radiopaque band at the midline of the maxilla. This is the nasal septum. The other border of the meatus is a curved line of contrast. These curved structures shown by the red dotted lines are the anterior parts of the inferior turbinates. If we trace from the common nasal meatus, we can find a radiolucent band, almost horizontal, extending distally. This radiolucent band superimposes over the inferior part of the orbit. This radiolucent band is the middle meatus. On the inferior part of the inferior turbinates, we can see another horizontal radiolucent band. I'm showing you the right side of the inferior meatus. Please identify the left inferior meatus. Inferior to the inferior meatus is the radiopaque band representing the heart palate. You have already learned this landmark, the heart palate. On the lateral aspects of the nasal septum are curved radiopaque bands. These are the walls of the nasal fossa. You can identify faint lines of contrast superimposed over the heart palate. These are the soft tissue outlines of the nose. At the midline, there is a thin radiolucent line representing the intermaxillary suture. Superimposed over the midline of the mandible is a wide, poorly defined radiopaque band. This is the shadow of the cervical vertebra. Let's use another panoramic radiograph to identify a few more landmarks. Superior to the condyle is a thick irregular radiopaque band. This is the floor of the middle cranial fossa. On the distal aspect of the condyle is a circular radiolucency. This radiolucency is the external auditory canal. Inferior to the heart palate is a line of contrast. There is a radiolucent band between this line of contrast and the heart palate. The line of contrast is the dorsum of the tongue. Ideally, a panoramic radiograph is taken with the dorsum of the tongue in contact with the heart palate. Therefore, the dorsum of the tongue should not be visible. On our previous example of a panoramic radiograph, we did not see that. Frequently, patients are unable to hold the tongue on the roof of the mouth. 
Therefore, the dorsum of the tongue may become visible. Superimposed over the maxillary incisors is a curved line of contrast. This is the outline of the upper lip. On our intraoral radiographic anatomic video, we had identified a radiolucent line representing the zygomaticotemporal suture. We can identify this radiolucent line. At the midline, between the central incisors of both the arches is a rectangular radio opacity. This is the bite positioning block. This block is used to position the anterior teeth in the focal trough. In some machines, a pencil-shaped bite block is used. Therefore, you may see a circular radio opacity representing the bite block. On the posterior aspect, we can see an outline of contrast representing the posterior pharyngeal wall. Please try to identify the posterior slope of the tongue and the epiglottis. Finally, let's talk a little bit about the radiopacity on the mesial aspect of mandibular right first molar. We'll learn more about this in fall semester when you will provide me with a differential diagnosis naming this condition as a dense bone island or an idiopathic osteosclerosis. You'll try to differentiate it from sclerosing osteitis or even peripical cementoosseous dysplasia. But that information is for the fall semester, when you will learn diseases and their appearances on radiographs. This is the end of the required landmarks as visible on panoramic radiographs. It is critical that you learn all the landmarks properly. A deviation of the normal anatomic landmark may indicate disease. Anytime you read a panoramic radiograph, you will have to look beyond the dental structures. Interpreting a panoramic radiograph is challenging, primarily due to the problematic appearance of the anatomic landmarks. So, please spend some time learning these radiographic landmarks. I'll see you again with another video tutorial on the cross-sectional anatomy or CBCT anatomy. See you then. Thank you.